Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you're joining us from across the world today. We are delighted and thrilled to have Daniel Riegler, co-founder of Karana, with us today. Um, and we're going to talk uh, to him about, an, uh, about Jackfruit, a lot of Jackfruit today. So we're going to talk around Jackfruit and what his company has done with Jackfruit um, as an alternative meat product. Um, so uh, welcome to the, uh, Pandemic Punditry, Daniel. Hi, thank you for having me. A pleasure. So we, we are talking to you as a part of this uh, ongoing series that we have called uh, Putting the Planet on a Pandemic Diet. Um, and we've been talking to a, a whole slew of uh, companies uh, on the alternative or smart protein side. Um, everything from sort of cultivate or cult uh, cultivated to cultured meat to plant-based meat to fermentation and, and even synthetic biology. So we're have, we have sort of straddling the gamut of all of the technologies that are out now uh, transforming uh, what we eat. So really thrilled to talk to you about jackfruit. And I'm sure there's, um, we're keen to understand, there must be some story there about how you met jackfruit or jackfruit meeting you. i uh, love to hear that uh, aspect of the of the story. Yeah, sure. It's, it's quite random. So I, I've spent quite a lot of my career on and off uh, majority of the last 10 years in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and pretty much most of my working career has been in developing markets, uh, more on the finance and consulting side, but because of the places I was working, I tend to do a lot of agriculture related projects. So I've always been very passionate about both food and sustainability and seeing firsthand how a lot of our food is produced led me to, to really understand the intersection of those two things a lot better. Um, so that started a, a slow burning interest in, in changing my own eating habits and, and moving towards a more sustainable way of eating, but also really looking at the business opportunity and something that I always struggled with in terms of kind of connecting scalable business ideas with my love of, of good food, uh, was really, how do you, you know, build a food business that actually does good, actually respects the integrity of the ingredients and is not just producing something else that's, you know, industrialized, kind of ruining um, what should be a source of, of pleasure and nutrition. You know, so many food is such an intimate, uh, important thing for everyone. Um, so as I was kind of first, I, I started to get interested in the insect protein space and, and work okay. with a few companies wow. in that space. And, you know, I saw some opportunities, but a lot of problems and increasingly plant-based became the obvious opportunity to me in terms of what we needed to do, um, where we need to move as consumers, where there was a really interesting business case. But again, I, I struggled with kind of, I was familiar with a lot of the mock meats that have been available in Asia for a long time. Uh, I was looking at, you know, some really interesting things that were happening in the plant-based meat space, but, you know, I, I saw a gap in terms of things that I'd come across, natural meat substitutes, including jackfruit. I didn't know much about it, but I, I'd been aware that, you know, there were ways <laughs> that had been around for a long time to make real plants, whole plants into interesting dishes and end products. And I was actually in although I'd spent time in Indonesia and, and all across Southeast Asia uh, and a little bit in, in South Asia, I was in London and uh, I, that was at a point where I was really making an effort to, to eat more plant-based, but I've, I've always grown up eating quite a lot of meat. Uh, and I had a taco that I thought was a pork taco and I actually discovered it was made with jackfruit and it was vegan. Uh, and that kind of really got me thinking. And right after that, I was, Going back to, I came to Singapore and I was spending time in Indonesia and I started looking into more on the jackfruit supply chain and, you know, really diving into local uses of jackfruit. And there are two things that became very clear. One was that jackfruit was really interesting, both in terms of how you can cook it and, you know, its versatility as an ingredient, if it's properly prepared and, and worked with. Um, but also its sustainability and sourcing stories. So as someone who's worked a lot on agricultural and supply chains and, and is really, you know, I care a lot about the farmer side of things and, and looking at the holistic supply chain, not just, 
you know, the need to move away from animal agriculture, the need to really fundamentally improve our food systems. Mm -hmm. um, so jackfruit just started ticking all these boxes, but what was also very apparent was the shortcomings of most of the available jackfruit products, how difficult it was to work with, that there was not a lot of innovation or you know, interesting R&D happening with jackfruit. It's always been sort of a forgotten crop. It's always been something that's viewed as something that, you know, you eat jackfruit if you have to because you can't afford meat or can't afford other things. Uh, and so it was always this very underappreciated when you start to realize how much waste there is in the jackfruit supply chain. It, it just made sense on so many levels. So then it was really just a question of figuring out what can we do with it? How can we try and solve that? Katika, do you have some questions for Daniel or you want me yeah, to ask? Yeah. Actually, interestingly, uh, Daniel, I was reading up uh, on one of the TechCrunch articles that came out uh, about Eat Karana. And in that, you said uh, Karana is a whole plant meat company mm -hmm. and that uh, that's your real differentiator from other companies who by and large kind of rely on commodity crops in processed forms. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that, please? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, that's what we see is that, you know, and, and this is not a slight on any of the other products in the market. I mean, we think there's room for what we need is more variety and more choice. But what we see is a huge skew towards uh, products that are made from protein isolates, whether they're coming from soy, pea, wheat. You know, again, this is tech that's been around for a long, long time. The yeah. mock meat industry, if you walk into any supermarket in Singapore, Malaysia, China, you'll find a wall full of very low priced mock meats uh, in the shape of any animal. So, you know, the formulations are improving, but the fundamental ingredients are, are still the same. And, and to get to that form of powdered soy concentrate or isolate requires quite an intensive processing, chemical, uh, um, uh, energy intensive, water intensive. So, and, and it's, it, when you see, when you look at what's really driving growth in the space as it moves towards mainstream consumers, uh, it's a, really a desire to eat healthier food and eat more transparent food. I mean, those are two major global trends that we're seeing across all markets. Uh, and a lot of these products are offering a interesting consumer choice from a product perspective but not hitting those boxes and i think you know our concern is that's something that's going to limit uh growth and mainstream adoption of the plant-based space so both for what we believe as a company you know food we're not just a plant-based company we're a good food company so we believe that you know the value that's created for the farmers the sustainability all throughout the supply chain you know, not just in a direct, and when you compare something, anything to beef, it always looks good, but yeah. you have to look sort of a layer further and say, okay, you know, we can't just switch to, you know, heavily processed soy products. We have to look beyond a lot of these monoculture crops. Um, and also we have to respond to what consumers are asking for, which is getting the nutritional benefit of plants. And when you're just taking, ever stripping everything but the protein out, uh, and adding in a lot of chemicals and stabilizers in order to to make that work, you're not responding to that. So what are you what are you saying, da Daniel? Is in um, sort of if I was to paraphrase you a little bit, is that you know nature does a superb job of creating jackfruit. I mean, I think uh, m maybe you can share some sort of nutritional information around the the benefits of jackfruit because you know. It's, I, I know even in Sri Lanka, people sort of use it as, uh, you know, sort of a, almost like a by the way kind of thing that's from jackfruit. It's not sort of a core food product, even in the country that you source most of your jackfruit from or all of your jackfruit from. Um, I, I remember I, I, I had one in the, in the house when I was living in Sri Lanka and in, in the middle of the night, the, the jackfruit would fall on the roof, make a huge, you know, it was like a bomb, right? You wake up a shock and that was the jackfruit falling. I mean, you know, it usually, you know, a lot of the stuff is sort of wasted. I mean, it just literally mm -hmm. falls off the tree and there's just so much of it. It's a very sort of prolific fruit bearing tree uh, and these are, these things are huge right so yeah uh, <laughs> uh, and so um, you know what is the nutritional value and i think if i was to paraphrase what you're saying is nature does a fabulous job of creating this jackfruit which is a complete food in itself um, all you're doing is sort of instead of isolating a particular nutrient you're actually using uh, all of it essentially or, or a large part of it um, yeah. minimally processing it to then create a, something that's a pork alternative, for example. 
exactly i mean the so the the great thing about jackfruit is the natural texture of it i mean again when you're talking about a a protein isolate it's basically turning it from a powder adding whatever you need to to then extrude it and mold it into the shape of whatever meat you want to replicate with jackfruit uh it's already in that kind of really nice shredded pulled fibrous pork but it can also go towards other meats uh Pork is sort of what it usually comes comes around to just because of the coloring and everything. And, and right. we see a huge opportunity. But it has this whole muscle fibrous quality to it that you don't need to, to make massive alterations. You don't need to denature the fruit or the product. Uh, and so I think one very important uh, thing to, to clarify, because this is something that gets confused a lot with jackfruit, is we use the young unripe jackfruit. So yeah. jackfruit to work as a meat alternative. And in in Sri Lanka, where we source from, and a lot of the, the countries in the region, you know, there's already a lot of local knowledge around this. Uh, but yeah, it has to be quite early stage before the sugars have started to form, uh, before the seeds are really starting to form so that you can get the most out of the fruit. And that allows us to really use all of it. I mean, aside from the peel, obviously. Um, but it's... Uh, yeah, it, it allows us to, to reduce a lot of waste. Your your story about the jackfruit falling off the tree, I mean, that's a big driver of waste, uh, aside okay. from animals, elephants, monkeys, squirrels coming and taking it. As soon as the fruits start to ripen, then you start to see a lot of drop off, a lot of wastage, a lot of rotting fruit, a lot of fruit being taken by animals. So only about in Sri Lanka, only about 10% of jackfruit is actually commercialized and about 70 percent is wasted so there's 70 local consumption yeah and wow. because these trees i mean they they tend to be run on on small older plots they tend yeah. to be planted you know mixed in with other higher value crops so a lot of time the jackfruit is just sort of forgotten uh people take a couple they want for at home maybe they can sell a few in the market but very little of it is actually being turned into any kind of value so there's a huge huge opportunity and we're talking about huge bioavailability as well uh, i mean there's it's not something that you don't need to go out and, and plant, you know, massive amounts of right away because right. it's already so much to, to tap into. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a huge opportunity. And then it's, and back to the nutritional profile. I mean, it, it offers the benefit, again, of eating a whole plant. So what you're getting uh, with jackfruit is a lot of fiber. You're getting, I mean, there's not a lot of protein in jackfruit, but there's a small amount. Like there, there will be a few grams per serving. But I mean, again, what we see is there's a big, big focus on protein right now. Uh, And most of us in the developed world and food secure countries get actually more protein than we need. And there's this move to sort of try and maximize the amount of protein, even in products that traditionally have not had much protein. And where most people, the majority of people are actually deficient is in fiber. And as I think we understand this is something we're seeing we work with a lot of nutritionists and and look at a lot of research coming out and this is very much what we expect to be one of the next major topics especially with an increased focus on health and wellness coming out of uh something like covid Mm -hmm. uh you know fiber is very very important then plus you know just the natural micronutrient mix there's things like potassium magnesium calcium um you know where there's a lot of just the benefits you get in jackfruit because it's the unripe uh, fruit because the sugars haven't formed. You're very low on the glycemic index front. So it has a lot of benefits going. So in terms of sort of, in, and you said you sort of, when you initially started, you were looking at the supply chain and the competitors. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people um, consider sort of value addition for jackfruit to making it. For example, I think in Kerala, somebody was um, taking the young jackfruit and making jackfruit flour. Um, and they recently figured that that is a low, low glycemic index and helps uh, people with diabetes. Uh, you know, obviously the canning of jackfruit um, is, has been a sort of a big thing, uh, making jackfruit chips, right? So people are, seem to be thinking sort of very uh, minimal value addition uh, till you guys sort of came around. And essentially now you're talking about, you know, one of those sort of the hottest things in the market in, in terms of food, which is, you know, a, a Pork alternative, right? So, um, so walk us. I mean, walk us through a little bit. I know your uh, process is proprietary, but you're not just taking jackfruit, putting some spices and sauces in it, 
and saying, okay, yeah, this is this is a, a folk alternative. You, there is a lot of technology and science behind what you're doing, and I think uh, that's what I think people sort of. I, I, I'm hoping as much as you can divulge that people get an appreciation for is that you know this is not you know get a jackfruit you know put some sauces package it and say uh here's pork right you're doing something very unique to it uh, and proprietary to it uh and that's where the real value add is correct yeah exactly so i mean basically what what you can see in jackfruit and, and there are a number of jackfruit products available in the market there has been an effort to to do more value add with jackfruit i uh, I think the two major constraints of jackfruit are, are one on the supply chain that it tends to be very fragmented supply chains. Uh, it you know in several markets it's still very seasonal, so it can be quite difficult to work with. You know the amount of uh, there's not a lot of infrastructure around sourcing yep. jackfruit. So if you haven't spent a lot of time working in uh, developing in frontier markets, then it can be quite challenging to, to tap into that and, and to actually learn to really understand what you're looking for in terms of uh, type. Because even between markets, the definition of what is considered, you know, the right maturity of jackfruit can vary quite a bit. Uh -huh. uh, so, so it's it's not a, a crop that has a lot of deep deep uh, research and, and general information availability around. Um, but the other is, is just, again, also because of the limited nature, the low volumes, it's not been a crop that's been heavily invested to in terms of product development standpoint. I mean, there are some very interesting things like with flour and some things around the seed. Uh, but in terms of turning it into a, a functional meat alternative, mm -hmm. uh, you pretty much have jackfruit that's packed in, in retort pouches and jackfruit that's canned. Uh, mm -hmm. And they both have pretty <laughs> heavy limitations. Yeah, uh, I mean, retorting jackfruit is very hard to get a really good texture. Uh, it, it sort of ends up just being Mush. still a unripe fruit uh, yeah. that you know you can kind of make look nice, but it's hard to get a really enjoyable, meaty experience out of it. Uh, and then the canning uh, can work. I mean, we launched a beta product that was a jarred jackfruit product in Singapore with a few restaurants. And you can get some really nice results from that, but it requires a lot of work in the kitchen. Uh, and, and those products vary quite quite a lot as well. Some are very mm -hmm. nice, some are not so nice. Uh, so you still, it's, it's not a scalable, um, user-friendly product. So that's where we really sought out to, to find that optimal point. We knew you can get jackfruit to that optimal point where it really starts to mimic pork, where it really is a great, texture for cooking where it's easy to cook where it's intuitive so we kind of you know reverse engineered from what we knew about how to work with jackfruit and it, it took quite a lot i mean it's been about two years of r d uh to get to that point but we now have our own yeah processing method and again it's not we're not doing anything you know hugely scientific to the jackfruit it's a very mechanical mm -hmm. process it's but it takes the jackfruit through a series of steps that get you to a result where it's it's easy to work with on the kitchen front. Uh, and then it's also easy to incorporate into a range of, of other products. So that's where we, we have our, our standard kind of pulled pork, shredded pork product. Uh, but we also then take it a step further and are, we'll be launching a range of dim sum and dumpling products. And then beyond that, quite a number of things. But it, it gives it a lot more flexibility and versatility to go into. So this comes, comes as a product that's ready to go to a chef or a, or a restaurant or, or to a consumer where they would put the seasoning or is it comes sort of pre-seasoned, sort of ready to put into a dumpling? Uh, so we'll, we will offer both versions. So we'll offer okay. the first products will be more geared towards chefs. And then as we go more into retail and consumer oriented products, they'll be a bit more uh, turnkey, so a bit more pre-seasoned, ready to cook. I think you had some questions on the t supply chain, I think. Yeah, um, actually, one of the uh, one of our very prolific uh, followers, he couldn't join us today, but he sent in the question. Um, he wants to know whether you believe Sri Lanka has the proper supply chain to supply you with uh, the jackfruits that you need. Uh, if not, what are the improvements we need to make? Uh, what Sri Lanka offers and is the reason, one of the main reasons we're there is an incredible knowledge around jackfruit, especially young jackfruit, polos, uh, 
as, as you well know, it's, it's called there. I mean, they had their own terms for the specific categories and you'll get that in other countries as well, but Sri Lanka really nails it in terms of the, the right seasons um, or the right stages of maturity. So uh, there's this really, this unbelievable, deeply ingrained local knowledge, appreciation and, and love of it as an ingredient. So that allows you to sort of make up for some of the lack of development in terms of any kind of, you know, really uh, sophisticated supply chain, because it allows you to expand that much faster. You don't have plantation style growing. You have the other benefit of Sri Lanka is you have these really incredible, small biodiverse mixed farms. And a really Sri Lanka has one of the most successful models for sustainable farming in the world. You've seen reforestation versus deforestation. So Sri Lanka, jackfruit is just one part of the story, but there's this really incredible smallholder, mid-sized farmer supply chain story in Sri Lanka that should be leveraged a lot more than it is. So that's something that we want to okay. be a, a part of helping grow it. And, and I think jackfruit can play a big part in that. It's still, you know, it's not the most developed compared to a market like Thailand, Vietnam, India, I mean, it's still much smaller scale. It tends to focus on quality over quantity. Uh, there are a lot of <laughs> missing links still in the supply chain, but it's a market where we feel there's a lot of potential and it's worthwhile investing in. So Dave, what, what would, I mean, I'm hoping that as people from the government, people from export development, all kinds of people listening in eventually to this uh, broadcast. So if you were to say, hey, Sri Lanka, give me, give me these three things, so I can continuously supply or, or, uh, or buy from Sri Lanka where jackfruit is concerned. I mean, is it, do it, do it, does it need, for example, refrigeration facilities, processing facilities? What is it that Sri Lanka can do as a country to encourage entrepreneurs such as yourself to use jackfruit as a raw material? If you had, the, if you were in, you know, you had a magic wand, what were the three things that you would say do now so, so it could yeah. make a really uh, seamless operation? I think processing capability is a, is a big one. Uh, I mean, there's so processing meaning sort of like like removing the the, the 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 skin and all that. You know, the, it's very hard. If anybody's tried to cut into a jackfruit, will know <laughs> what Daniel means by processing. I get exactly, and just the sophistication of operations. I mean, export grade. There's a lot of export. I mean, Sri Lanka has a very established spice and tea export business, but shifting that to, to working with wet products like jackfruit and again moving beyond something that's just a canning operation okay. gets a bit complicated and yeah it's it's definitely a constraint so i think and there there are a lot of very good operators there i mean mm -hmm. i think just providing funding and technical support and making that more accessible i mean we've started to, to look for i mean it would be great if there was some some more grant funding and uh there's been various pilot programs and things that we've read about, but finding actual actionable support programs has been challenging. You know, we've been looking for support for some manufacturing partners we work with uh, to, to build out more of the supply chain. We've been speaking with a number of NGOs and looking at expanding it that way. So I think just helping any support in terms of helping expand that, because especially right now when we can't be you know fully on the ground there, uh, it's it's limited so communication is also a big challenge and, and consistency of qa standards uh there's a lot of room okay. for hmm. interesting so we'll see whether we can pass the message along to the the powers that be and the ears that need to hear that uh from my end uh keen to sort of promote sri lanka as a alternative protein destination as much as we can uh, i'm originally from there i live in delhi but uh uh, Kartika is in Sri Lanka, so whatever we can do to help the process along would be useful. Um, the, 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 do you actually take the uh, fruits uh, sort of in a frozen way or a canned? I mean, how do you get it from Sri Lanka? What, when, how does it arrive in your factory? In what form? Uh, so I, I can't disclose the full form, but it is okay. we, we basically do a, a semi uh, finished product coming out of Sri Lanka. Okay. So we, okay. we do it in a shelf stable way, so we don't need to, to ship it frozen or anything. Okay. Um, but uh, so there's yeah, some processing you already do in Sri Lanka. That, yeah. Forward. So we do the first okay. stage of the processing in Sri Lanka, and then okay. we can do the second stage uh, locally. But eventually, we're hoping we can get to a point where we can do a bulk of the processing, if not all of it, in Sri Lanka. It's just right, right. now the capabilities for that to meet audit requirements and things are a bit limited. Okay. 
that's so good to know. Are you actually looking for partners? Uh, because I know that was one of the questions that uh, the ag tech entrepreneurs had asked us was whether you're looking for partners uh, to help you do the manufacturing in Sri Lanka. Yeah, we're always looking for partners on the manufacturing side, on the supply chain side. Great, great. So um, just shifting gears a little bit. So, you know, the market that you're targeting is uh, Asia Pacific, I assume, right, or the Southeast Asian market where pork uh, is, is consumed in, in large quantities. Um, interestingly, just I think last week, uh, you know, uh, David Young and Green Monday Holdings uh, just got $70 million for Omnipore, right? Uh, we, we're going we're gonna to chat with David on the 21st uh, as well. Um, so interesting. So you know they they obviously gonna you know have they they're already having a significant impact on the alternate protein scene, especially for pork. Um, and there's also future food that we interviewed uh, the minced pork product out of Malaysia. Um, and now there's uh, jackfruit as a potential pork alternative as well. So I, I you know from my perspective, people in that a a country are damn lucky they got three alternatives to pick from <laughs> potentially and, and growing uh, you know wish we could say the same thing here in India but um, uh, it's great to see that how do you see that whole sort of uh, play out I mean you've got you know you, you got yourselves you got Omniport you got others also coming into the scene um, what is your thoughts on sort of that whole competitive scene or, or do you see them as as people amplifying your message and, and it's a it's a good way to sort of uh, go to market as a combined, you know, or as a group entity that doing alternative pork. Absolutely. I mean, we're very much like there's a lot of hype and a lot of noise and discussion right now about plant-based meat. It is the hot thing. Food is a big space, and this is great because it's very much in the rising tide, lift its all boats phase. Yes. We are. What we have to keep in mind is we're still in the very, very nascent you know, first stages of this growth. It's we're still very much at the early adopter, you know, influx period. Mm -hmm. But I, I was actually stuck in the US for the last six months. I only got back to Singapore a few weeks ago. Uh, and where you see that, you know, where there that market is more mature. And that means they're two or three years ahead, basically. And Correct. the level of, you know, of adoption, the amount of, of plant based offerings and things and not even a flood of new products. There are some, but just the variety, the knowledge and restaurants, the availability, the access uh, to, to plant-based options, whether they're whole plant, more traditional, more novel, plant-based meats. You can definitely see that coming here. When I when we first started Karana, it was before Beyond and Impossible had launched in Singapore. It was before Omnipork had, you know, launched their products and None of this was in the news yet, and people were totally dismissive. You know, nobody yeah. would ever believe that in Singapore anyone would have any interest in a vegan product. And look at how the dialogue and the narrative and stuff is changing. This this is one of those trends that just will continue to grow. It will only get significantly bigger, and the more choice, the more product, the more healthy competition. We need to be challenging each other as an industry. We need to be giving consumers a choice to steer the industry in the right direction. It's there's there's a long way to go. There's a lot of room for a lot of different products and and that's what will make this successful in the long term. It's not a question of competing for, you know, market share at this point. It's really about making this become a more significant movement. So so we're very much, you know, we're A, we're comfortable in our positioning that we offer, you know, quite right. a value proposition and then Again, we see that very much as a long-term uh, position to take, and, and where the market will head. So we're we're not concerned about being the first or being you know the biggest name right now. Like we think this, there's a lot of room for this industry to mature and to have a lot of opportunity for a lot of different brands and products. It's a it's a great perspective to have. I think uh, uh, I, I think people sometimes get. Um, Sort of sidetracked by the fact, oh, you know, there's competitor, uh, competitors. I think in this space, the more the merrier because it just creates a, 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 a significant amount of buzz that then essentially carries everybody across and and uh, and consumer choice. I mean, that's that's a, that's a key ingredient there. And, uh, and any so, industry needs competition. I mean, that's yeah, I agree. One hundred and one. Yeah. 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 True. Um, we have a few audience questions come in. Uh, one is, which is the best variety of jackfruit for alternate protein? So, 
like I was saying before, the really critical thing is the maturity. So we, we're exploring a lot around different varieties and cultivars, and it depends. I mean, you have some markets where there's more sophisticated planting and management, and then some like in Sri Lanka, there's most of it is semi wild grown or not really managed. It's trees that have been growing for hundreds of years and people know, you know, <laughs> on a very local level, what type it's either Waraka or Wala, you know, the harder, softer varieties. But within that, there's not much <laughs> variance that's, that's offered to you in terms of, you know, specific cultivars or anything. But what we generally find is, is because we're using that unripe stage, we have a fair amount of flexibility. Uh, so really, it, it comes down to that maturity is the most critical thing for us at this point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so people are already interested to know whether the finished product will be available in Sri Lanka. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I genuinely hope that that it will be at some point soon because, uh, I mean, that's where I would love to to have it available in, in Sri Lanka. I mean, that's when we, although you already have a lot of really good fresh polos in Sri Lanka, so we'll have to see if it can compete there. But yeah, I, I would love for that to happen. I don't know whether this data point has reached you yet, Daniel, but uh, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan government and the cabinet just banned uh, the slaughter of cows. I saw that. I saw yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, I think there are a lot of people craving their beef curry and, uh, you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, a, a Karana version of beef curry would be, uh, you know, a welcome. I think a, I think a polos taco at Taco Bell would work nicely, too. Oh, yes. we'll, we'll see. I think there will be a time for that. Great, great. Uh, so in terms of sort of, you know, future plans for Karana, um, so is it pork that you're singularly going to be focused on or and are you thinking of, you know, in, in this sort of mince or, or like, you know, stripes, or I guess, or flesh parts of, you know, like shredded, is it shredded and minced pork kind of thing or is it other other things in mind as well? Right now, I mean, because of where we are with the products and, and with the jackfruit, it, it is the shredded and minced pork category. Okay. That's the sort of our, our well, literal lowest hanging fruit for us right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, in the future, we have a lot of ambitions beyond pork, beyond jackfruit. So, I mean, we want to take this sort of model and platform that we're building around jackfruit and taking an underutilized, underappreciated, undercommercialized, but really great crop. And there's so many others. I mean, we consume, uh, I'm trying to remember the statistic, but it's something ridiculous, like uh, 150 out of 30,000, you know, edible plant species, uh, the amount, you know, and we're so focused in something like 10 to 15 plants and animal varieties make up 70 plus percent of, you know, yeah. our global diet. It's just ridiculous how concentrated, how reliant we are on, you know, a few singular crops. So yeah. there's, Jackfruit is just the tip of the iceberg for us in terms of what we want to be doing and looking at. So we already have quite a quite a few things uh, identified that we're excited about, but we also need to take things one step at a time. Sure. So, so are you? So I think in, in sort of interwoven into that uh, that point is the fact that you see jackfruit not just simply as a as a pork uh, alternative meat alternative, but it could actually be meat alternative. So I mean, you could do a chicken one, you could do a beef one, you could do yeah, a yeah. jackfruit. You, jackfruit you that taken, yeah, in many different directions. So for sure, great. I mean, yeah. Great. Great. Um, so, yeah, sorry, Dan. Um, Lavi and I are actually hosting a whole bunch of um, sessions on the climate emergency in uh, November, and it was interesting because when I was reading up uh, on Eat Corona, one of the things you'd said was that uh, jackfruit is a more environmentally friendly crop. So, with the whole climate emergency and everything that we're facing right now, how does a product like jackfruit actually help address that? Yeah. I mean, for me, that's still what gets me the most excited about jackfruit. I think the sourcing story from an environmental standpoint, but also when we're talking about sustainability, we have to think about the people who are growing the food as well, because there's a huge human component and community component mm -hmm. in this also. Mm -hmm. So from an environmental standpoint, I mean, again, just the fact that you have a crop that it has 60, 70 percent plus wastage is already Right. an environmental issue that needs addressing. So you're you're already just by using in the first place, there's there's an immediate benefit. Right. Um, then, of course, that's creating economic value as well at the local level. Uh, but then in terms of, you know, jackfruit, uh, you're looking at metrics. Jackfruit, like you're saying, is very, very high yielding. So, I mean, we have farmers who they have a, a four hectare plot 
they're literally producing 10 to 15 tons of jackfruit in a season from, and again, that's not on like they have a farm full of jackfruit. They have, I think, eight to 10 trees Ooh. that are shading their higher belly crops. They're growing vanilla. They're growing pepper vines up the jackfruit trees. They're growing uh, cacao, uh, all these really turmeric, all these really you know interesting things. And jackfruit is a part of that. So it's the total opposite of a monoculture soy or pea cultivation. Um, and jackfruit is doesn't need a lot of water. It doesn't need a lot of input. So, you know, from a direct environmental standpoint, but also in terms of the ability for farmers who have less te technical or, or financial capabilities, it's, it's quite friendly and it can yield a lot on less productive land. It's uh, resistant to soil degradation, it's, it's drought resistant. So it has so many benefits going for it. But even on a, on a per hectare yield, I mean, a planted hectare of jackfruit versus a planted hectare of soy, it's something like jackfruit yields, again, depending on the maturity, depending on the variety, anywhere from 15 to 20 up to even 40, 50 tons per hectare versus soy, I think it's like, between two and six. Uh, wow. Don't quote me on those numbers, but Wait, it's, it's still a, still a huge yeah. trend there. Wow. 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 Mm -hmm. So we just had another question come in. Would you profile a pork eater differently from other meat eaters? Um, I mean, I think it, it varies a lot by geography. So, I mean, obviously, like we get a lot of questions around, you know, well, aren't you cutting off the halal market by, by framing things as, as pork? And it is something we, we think a lot about, but we have to look at where the market is right now. And I mean, the single biggest markets are still for this in this stage are in, you know, the more developed parts of East Asia. So China, Korea, Japan, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, and in Western markets as well, US, Europe, uh, Latin America even is, is emerging in a lot of the bigger economies there. And pork consumption is massive. It's still one of, if not the most widely consumed meat. Uh, and there's not as many. I mean, we have a lot of burger alternatives, a lot of chicken nugget alternatives. We don't have a lot of pork alternatives, especially that sort of shredded braised pork, which is a very universal application. Um, so that's really how we've come to, to that profile and because the jackfruit, you know, lends itself so naturally well to, to that profile. So, uh, I mean, I think there's, there's just, there are a lot of consumers of pork in the world. It's a really loved, I grew up between Europe and the U S I was born in Austria and that's a very pork heavy country. The U S is very pork. Actually, I eat almost no pork now. I'm mostly plant-based, uh, but I grew up eating a huge amount of pork. So I have a strong appreciation for pork and finding, you know, things that really replicate uh, from a textural standpoint. Uh, and I think a lot of, you know, those kind of home recipes, you know, dishes that people grew up with their family, their grandmothers cooking are those kind of, you know, traditional slow cooked pork things. So you can really connect to, to people with, with pork in a different way. Burgers, I mean, are, are kind of a very generic product compared to a lot of pork dishes. Yeah. Uh, so when would it be commercially ready? So we're actually uh, planning to launch, uh, still on limited scale. I mean, we're coming out, we were a bit delayed on a number of things uh, due to COVID, but we're, we're getting back on track. So we're actually hoping to launch, uh, if not by the end of this month, then at the very beginning of, of November in Singapore okay. and start to expand step by step from there. Okay. And when you say start to expand step by step, are you in, in Southeast Asia primarily first? Yeah, I think, well, I think actually even just across the region, I mean, we're looking at uh, Hong Kong as a potential market for us, but we've okay. also been doing a lot of looking at in markets back west, uh, other markets in the region. I mean, we're, these days, I think the key thing is, is to be flexible and to be open to opportunities as they arise and what's realistic in terms of places where we can travel and go and where there's a market oh, yeah. opportunity. So Singapore is our, is our launch market and is a great test market. So, you know, we're going to be looking at things here and then that will determine where we really sort of focus the next six to 12 months. So I um, got to ask this question. So what has been the, the response of the test marketing that you've done? <laughs> it's been very positive. Uh, we, I mean, I think we, we put a lot of time and effort into our products and we, okay. maybe we've gone a bit too slowly and focus too much on, on really getting them to where we want them. But 
we're really proud of what we've done with our products and the response has been very much sort of recognizing that uh, it's yeah, it's been very positive, both in terms of the taste and, and the sensory experience, but also the story. I mean, I think, you know, it really proves that this story, this farming story, the fact that we know our, our farmers, the fact that, you know, we can show exactly what we're using, uh, where it's coming from. It's something that people can, can get their heads around very easily. That really, really works with chefs, with consumers. So there's, there's really just very positive feedback all around. So uh, I think we have a question on uh, what is the price it's penalty? Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, when you come out. I'm assuming that's versus pork, because um, yeah. we can also look at it versus other plant-based meats. And if you look at something like Impossible, especially in Singapore, where it's still extremely expensive, yeah. where we're already below them um, quite significantly. But uh, our goal is to is to get to parity with pork, and and really we're just limited by our, our scale as a as a small company with a new product and relying heavily on on third parties for a lot of things not being able to be very efficient with logistics and stuff and so we're quite confident that we'll be able to get there probably sooner than later as, as we were actually able to scale up and get things going so i think um if eventually if uh, sri lanka I, I, do we have um, sri lanka have a trade agreement with singapore a free trade agreement with singapore yet yeah yeah it does right yeah, yeah. so uh, eventually i think they're planning on having one with with china as well so that could make uh, sort of manufacturing and shipping uh, to the for to the Southeast Asian and Chinese uh, China uh, relatively uh, easy proposition for you. Yeah, and, and I mean that's also one of the other benefits of Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is actually great as a logistics hub. It, it's very strategically positioned, so uh, we see a lot of opportunity. I mean, especially the ingredients beyond jackfruit. You know, the spice blends you can get, the yes, quality of, of cooking, and the knowledge and appreciation of food. Sri Lanka is an amazing. If, Anyone who loves food needs to go to Sri Lanka as soon as you can go back there uh, because, I mean, it's, yeah, it, in the farm, like I was talking about earlier about the farming story, there's there's a great, great opportunity for the Sri Lanka story, and we would love to be a part of that, you know, bringing Sri Lankan products to the world. So. Oh, great. Well, I'm sure that's music to the ears of a lot of people listening in today. Um, so. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so, Daniel, you and, uh, and uh, Blair uh, Crichton, who are the, uh, the co-founders, co 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 um, how, how big is your team now? I mean, do you have, I mean, do you need to have food technologists and nutritionists and all these kind of people? I, I'm just trying to give an idea for, for, you know, people who may be interested in starting a food, um, food startup, you know, what should be sort of the ideal team composition? What kind of people do you need to have to sort of make this, uh, you know, alternative protein viable? Yeah. Well, the good news is that two people who have very little experience beyond a, a sort of love of food and, a, you know, <laughs> passing bit of uh, working with other companies uh, can start a food startup and get it up and running. But yeah, it became very obviously very quickly that we needed to build out the technical side of the team. So our, our, our first uh, major hire uh, was our, our food scientist, our chief science officer, he's a food chemist by background, uh, Dr. Karsten Karstens, who's been you know instrumental in, in getting the products to to where we want. I mean, I, I come from a more, like I said, that supply chain background. So that okay. allowed us to really get deep into the supply chain quite early and, and push push things there. But we've since been building out the supply chain side of the business, obviously the product development and food science. Um, and because of our you know, focus on the ingredients, on the processing, on kind of every stage of the, the value chain, and that includes everything from engineering experience to, to food science and chemistry. We have a, a chef in residence, Somia Venkatasan, who was a Singapore master chef finalist who's been wow. working with us from the early days as well. So we've always been very, very culinarily focused as well. So very much you know, involving chefs and, and really looking at things in the kitchen first and then the lab. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's always, I think, you know, those specific technical skill sets are very important, but building a team of people who really love food and really believe in and buy into what we're doing uh, and how we're doing it is the most critical thing. And also, I mean, people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and drop into the, <laughs> the bush and, and, and get things going uh, is also pretty critical. So you've got to have people who are quite versatile and flexible. I think we have a couple more questions. Uh, is the product going to be shelf stable when, when it comes out, or is it going to be frozen, uh, chilled? 
So most of our, our, our products are, are going to be frozen in their final stage, and we're okay. going to look to add shelf-stable ones in time. Kathy? Um, yeah, just uh, one more question actually um, coming in, um, saying uh, what what are the hurdles that um, you know you faced while you were raising your first round? Many. I mean, raising money is always sort of the thorn in the side of any startup, even in this space where it's, you know, a very exciting, sexy space. But, you know, you get a lot of investors who want to look at you, especially, you know, being a plant based, one of the few plant based startups in Asia, obviously attracts a lot of attention, but doing something fundamentally differently from what a lot of companies in the space are doing also, you know, brings a lot of uncertainty and questions. So what we found was that the investors who really got what we were doing tended to be the more strategics, which was the profile we were looking for anyway. So mm -hmm. I would say most of our investors have a pretty strong uh, strategic element or either coming from a food background or have some distribution, supply chain, food processing, food product development uh, or F&B component. And, and that's, that's been great for us. You, you just raised $1.7 million, I think, in July, right, of this year? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure you're in, in a continuous raise mode to... to uh, <laughs> Always. Uh, I've been working with enough startups in my life to know that. So. <laughs> that, never, that never stops. <laughs> that never stops. Especially these exactly. days. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, Kathika, we're right at that 45-minute mark. So uh, any more questions or you want to... We're yep, good. We're good. D Daniel, uh, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you know... I'm a huge fan of Sri Lanka's Polos curry. I, I live for it. Uh, I miss it when I'm, I live in India, and, and Karthika loves it as well. But I think, um, you know, most importantly, I think you outlined uh, at least uh, at a very high level uh, what Sri Lanka needs to do to continue to have you as a, a long-term partner uh, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, grow with you. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that people listening here will take notice of that. Um, we're happy to f help facilitate whatever you need on this end if we can as much as we can to use our influence to to make that happen. I think there's a, a large push within Sri Lanka now, uh, maybe because of the pandemic and, and uh, in general, to sort of see what we can do to help uh, our farmers. And I think you, you've you been, you know, without much publicity or without much knowledge locally uh, in from a Sri Lankan context, you know, helping farmers tremendously. Uh, so I think uh, maybe we need to sort of create more of a buzz around what you're doing in Sri Lanka so people are a little bit more self-aware that such a thing exists and that, you know, Sri Lanka is helping, uh, you know, whole of Southeast Asia and potentially China, you know, have a alternative pork product on their shelves. So that's, that's a great story. We wanted to tell that story and that's why uh, we decided to have you on the show. So thank you very much for, for taking time out from a, from a very busy schedule to speak with us. Uh, yeah, no. and, and we can't wait to try your product when it comes out. I hope that one day there'll be a Chow Sao pork. <laughs> made of jackfruit, which it, all the pounds I have on me is from eating chow sao pork when I was a kid in Singapore. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little partial to that. <laughs> well, I, I hope it, it's it's only a matter of time. Uh, and yeah, you know, I think it's my pleasure. And, and like, yeah, to your point on Sri Lanka, I think, you know, I hope Sri Lanka can appreciate that what they have is an export story is not just physical products, but this model, this sustainable farming model that is really, really something unique there. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf, yeah, on behalf of Karthik and me, thank you for coming to Pandemic Punditry, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Thanks. 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 Bye. Bye.